Good morning, good afternoon, um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, um, wherever you are. Um, uh, it's a, a, a pleasure to have you all on um, this afternoon's webinar. Uh, my name is Andrew Nicholson. I'm the CEO and co-founder of um, Osprey Flight Solutions. Um, we uh, are going to dive um, in, in a fairly deep way into an, an aviation focused update on the situation um, in, in Israel and Gaza um, this afternoon. And as as usual for these webinars, we have the privilege of having um, Matthew Borry, one of the other co-founders and our chief intelligence officer, um, to present um, from the depths of experience and knowledge, um, but also critically from the data that we have been uh, have been gathering for for many years um, on the region uh, as well. Um, a couple of things I just wanted to say before we uh, we start. Um, firstly, um, thank you all for those uh, for those of you sent through questions beforehand. Um, we will address some of those um, at the end of the uh, of the webinar, uh, and of course there is a Q and A section as always um, within Zoom. So if you do have questions during the uh, the webinar, please do put them in there. And if we have time at the end of the webinar, um, we will address those um, those questions uh, in a Q and A session at, at the end. Um, we've also uh, we, we're doing this in partnership with with our strategic uh, partners, Gallagher Aerospace, um, the insurance broker. Um, and they've just asked us to say they didn't have anyone available to speak today, um, but uh, we'd like to thank them for supporting this webinar, uh, of course. Um, and also, if any attendees today um, have questions as to the insurance impact from the situation in, in, in Israel and Gaza, um, we'd encourage them to speak directly with um, their, their, their team member from, from Gallagher's or their insurance team um, to understand that, that, uh, that impact and get their advice. Um, uh, uh, so that's that. Without further ado, um, I'd like to hand over to um, Matt, uh, who's going to dive into uh, in detail the, the situation update um, in the region. Over to you, Matt. Thank you, Andrew. And again, thank you for everyone who's taken the time today to join the Osprey webinar. The focus of uh, the webinar will be the Israel-Gaza situation. However, we will also discuss uh, wider regional implications, specifically related to Lebanon and Syria, and then other areas afar will be addressed as well uh, at the end of the update. As uh, we go into today's briefing, I do want to highlight that Osprey is using a proprietary set of AI tools coupled with our analyst expertise and industry leading technology to monitor both indicators of escalation and de-escalation related to the Israel-Gaza conflict, which does have regional implications. Uh, these tools and our expertise extend beyond uh, just the situation in Israel. Uh, we're closely monitoring developments in Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and Yemen, uh, which could face uh, difficulties depending on how this conflict evolves. However, today's webinar is going to take a look at how this war began. We'll do a current situation update for the Israel-Gaza front in the south and the uh, Israeli borders with Lebanon and Syria in the north. We'll look at uh, current regulatory notices that have been issued, as well as uh, issues within the regional airspace. We have some data analytics from Osprey Explore uh, and our AI uh, technology from Osprey Squawk uh, to highlight how we're utilizing the power of data to inform our assessments as an analyst team at Osprey. We have some very in-depth information on weapon system capabilities for all of the actors at play. This includes Israel, uh, Palestinian armed groups in Gaza, Lebanese Hezbollah, the Syrian military, and Iranian-backed militant groups in Syria. Lastly, we have some short-term forecasts that are focused not only on the Israel-Gaza fr Gaza front, but also on the front in the north on the Lebanon-Syria borders, and again, uh, information on key takeaways for a, a regional impact. So starting off, I do want to just highlight how Osprey collects our data. We have over 200,000 sources that we're collecting every 15 minutes in a variety of languages. Uh, this is done uh, through some uh, proprietary web scraping tools. We utilize machine learning to structure uh, the data uh, that is pulled in, and then our data modeling classifies the data that is, is brought in uh, based on location, uh, incident type, time of day, uh, as well as a, a summary of uh, actors, weapons, uh, and or uh, different types of key uh, data points. 
that is done uh, through our deep learning AI models, and it is interpreted then by our analysts. Our analyst team verifies every piece of data that goes into our incident database, uh, which is over uh, 2 million incidents in the last five years. We have that data then inform our analysis, and our analysis can come in the forms of our risk assessment reports, our alerts, and our forecasts, which are uh, clients who have uh, access to our full suite of services utilized in their risk management processes. Predictive intelligence is a big part of what Osprey does. Uh, I hope this slide can give some insights on, on why uh, we're doing things the way we are. We have a 98% accuracy rate on our forecasts year to date. And within 2023, there's been six major events that Osprey has been proactive on informing our clients from ranges of 48 hours to 72 hours to seven days, 11 days. And in the most recent Israel-Gaza conflict, 12 days ahead of time, uh, we were warning of rocket fire and or drone launches from Gaza into southern Israel being likely in um, uh, a short term period and that uh, airspace activity uh, in northern and southern uh, Israel uh, could expose hazards to aviation through the end of the year. In the lead up to the conflict on the 22nd of uh, September, Osprey uh, AI anomaly detection within our data set uh, detected increased levels of conventional military activity related to Israel and Gaza. We then issued a forecast that rocket fire was 85% likely in the near term. On the 26th of September, as I, I just noted, we issued a situation update, which included a forecast that uh, projectile launches, including drones or rockets, uh, were uh, near certain to the 9th of October or a, a two week time frame. Um, and on uh, the 27th and 26th of September, we had additional AI anomaly detections. Suspected IDF airstrikes were covered in alerts on the 1st and 3rd of October into Syria. And then we had additional AI anomaly detections on the 5th and 6th of October of uh, increased activity levels in Syria. All of this put together uh, did paint a clear picture that escalation was likely. How I do wanna highlight that Osprey did not fully predict the scale of this con conflict at present. Uh, to my knowledge, there's really no one out there that could have seen the entirety of what's occurred so far taking place. However, if you're an Osprey client with access to our AI anomaly detection tool Squawk, our situation updates, our alerts, and our forecasts, you had the ability to proactively put plans in place that should an escalation occur, which did happen on the 7th of October, you could make informed, efficient decisions to minimize disruption to your business. After the event started on the 7th of October, within one hour of the rocket fire from Gaza, Osprey issued a critical alert on uh, the uh, situation, including uh, the uh, rocket fire that reached as far as, as Tel Aviv at that point. Uh, within another hour, so two hours after the start of the rocket fire, we had um, raised our risk ratings to um, high for Israeli airspace, uh, the country, and um, airports. Uh, and then we continued to issue alerts throughout the 7th of October. And then until late on the 7th of October, no governing bodies had issued anything on uh, the uh, situation in Israel. Um, not until days after did we start to see um, notams being issued by um, the U.S., Canada, a CZIB from, from EASA. The key point here is that it takes apolitical, independent, open source intelligence for aviation operators, insurers, and even governments to have a clear understanding of when a conflict situation is escalating. And Osprey is the industry leader in providing that to uh, a variety of, of aviation sector um, clientele. Here's the forecast we issued on the 26th of September. You can see the activity in the weeks leading up to this um, shows a clear escalation in, in Israel. And you can clearly see that we assessed that there remained an increased likelihood of unsafe air and air defense activity on the Israeli borders with Gaza um, that is likely to persist through 2023, and that we expected rocket fire and drone launches from Gaza into southern Israel uh, by the 9th of October, i.e. two weeks from the 26th of September. So now we'll dive into kind of what's happened since the 7th of uh, October. On the 7th of October, the Palestinian armed group Hamas declared the start of Operation Al-Aqsa flood. They claimed they were targeting Israeli sites, airports, and military installations. 
Uh, they began launching rockets in large barrages at Israel, and they also conducted uh, airborne uh, naval and ground incursions across the border fence um, into southern Israel, and a large number of gunfights ensued. Over 1,300 Israelis have reported been reportedly been killed during um, the fighting since 7 October with over 4,000 wounded. However, Israel has stated that it has regained control of the, the border towns, and now the fighting is contained to Gaza, um, where the IDF is conducting uh, Operation Iron Swords, uh, which is aimed at uh, airstrikes significantly uh, intended to weaken the Palestinian Islamic Jihad and the Palestinian armed group Hamas. Uh, no progress on a ceasefire has been reported at this time. We've had over 300,000 is Israeli Defense Forces reservists called up. And based on public statements by the Israeli PM uh, and our uh, view of the situation, an IDF ground operation is likely to take place within the next uh, 14 days and could last for several months. Hamas has called on regional resistance factions in Gaza, the West Bank, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, and Yemen to uh, unite against Israel. This activity is happening amid the 50th anniversary of the Yom Kippur War, which included a southern incursion into Israel from Egypt and a northern incursion into Israel from Syria. And much of the activity today we're seeing uh, has some of the hallmarks of that, that prior conflict. We've also seen PIJ and Hamas offic officials being in Lebanon in July and August and September for different events where they've publicly um, done press conferences and uh, shown their coordination with Lebanese Hezbollah. Each of those groups also operate in Syria. With, since the 7th of October, there's been over 3,000 Israeli airstrikes into Gaza. Approximately 1,000 deaths have occurred in Gaza and over 5,000 injuries. Over 5,000 rockets have been launched from Gaza at Israel. The majority of these at uh, the southern uh, district area of Israel, many of them falling in open areas. The IDF Iron Dome has shot down over 2,000 that have uh, targeted uh, populated centers in Israel. However, bar barrages of rocket fire have occurred daily um, deeper into Israel to include Jerusalem, the Tel Aviv envir environs, um, as well as near uh, Israel's Ben Gurion International Airport in Tel Aviv. The Iron Dome has been uh, successful in shooting down the vast majority of projectiles in uh, these populated areas. However, debris from a rocket shoot down on the 9th of October landed approximately one kilometer from Ben Gurion International Airport in Tel Aviv. Today, we have had rocket fire north of Tel Aviv from Gaza, so transiting all the way over uh, the top of Tel Aviv before shoot downs occurred. In, in northern Israel. And yesterday, uh, a rocket fired from Gaza reached as far as Haifa. So this shows that the conflict is not isolated to southern Israel related to Gaza. It has extended to central Israel, the Tel Aviv environs, and uh, to northern areas, including as far as Haifa. Along with the current situation in Gaza, the front with Lebanon and Syria has also uh, heated up from the 8th to the 11th of October. Approximately 45 rockets have been launched from southern Lebanon, mainly by Hezbollah, who has claimed responsibility for some of these rocket launches. They've also claimed several anti-tank guided missile launches as well um, across the border at Israeli Defense Forces targets. The IDF has responded with limited sets of uh, artillery strikes and airstrikes on the Lebanese border daily from 8 through 11 October. And on the 8th of October, in a very concerning event, the IDF employed a Patriot conventional SAM system, which is capable up to flight level 800 and out to 100 miles to reportedly shoot down an aerial target over northern Israeli airspace along the Lebanon border. UN peacekeepers have reported conducting uh, patrols on the Lebanese border to try to to inhibit the fighting from spreading further, though the UN peacekeeping forces are going to be limited in containing any flare-up and hostilities between Lebanese Hezbollah, other militant groups in Lebanon, and the IDF uh, in the near term. On the 10th of October, rockets were also launched from southern Syria into the Israeli Golan Heights. Israel again responded uh, similarly to they had in Lebanon with a limited set of artillery strikes into uh, Syria's Kunetria government. On the 10th of October, 
suspected IDF strikes were reported into Syria on the Iraq-Syria border against Iranian-backed militant group targets reportedly involved in weapons smuggling. And just before the webinar began today, Osprey issued a critical alert because suspected IDF strikes were launched against Aleppo International Airport and Damascus International Airport. These strikes likely targeted weapons shipments that were in, destined for Iranian-backed militant groups in the region, likely including Hezbollah. These strikes in Syria clearly indicate that a regionalized conflict is uh, a realistic possibility to Osprey. Strikes against Damascus International Airport and Aleppo International Airport also increase the potential of retaliatory strikes coming from Syria or Lebanon by Iranian-backed militant groups or Hezbollah against targets inside of Israel, and a tit-for-tat scenario of targeting Tel Aviv Airport from Lebanon or Syria is on the table based on the Israeli airstrikes targeting Damascus and Aleppo International Airports today. Now, I'm not gonna go through each one of these regulatory notices in detail. Uh, however, what I would like to say is you can see a number of regulatory bodies have issued notices. Israel is actively issuing NOTAMs uh, for its airspace. It has issued one specific to the conflict situation in the region, uh, and it advises operators to exercise cautions and to expect delays. In addition, Israel is issuing NOTAMs for Ben Gurion Airport regarding operational procedures for flights to and from Tel Aviv. Uh, EASA, the U.S., and Canada have issued advisories, but no restrictions regarding flight operations in for Tel Aviv due to the conflict situation. Um, and Russia and Cyprus have issued similar um, advisories as well. Pre-existing NOTAMs um, are already in place uh, for areas within 200 nautical miles of Syria, which includes all of Fur Beirut and all of Fur Tel Aviv, issued by the U.S., U.K., and Canada due to increased military activity. GPS disruption and errant missile launches. Uh, now, these are only advisories. They don't actually restrict any forms of flight operations. However, uh, these were in place for years um, prior to what has happened on since the 7th of October. So the US, Canada, and the UK essentially have highlighted to operators that errant missile launches and GPS interference was already present in, in this area prior to uh, what's emerged now. And these issues have only been exacerbated by the, the escalation and fighting in uh, the south near Gaza, as well as on the borders with Lebanon and Syria. And then again, several authorities for years have had um, prohibitions or restrictions um, or advice to defer flight operations over Syrian airspace uh, for any purposes. These are the key issues that Osprey is looking at when it comes to Lebanese, uh, Syrian, and Israeli airspace. We have groups who possess all altitude capable air defense systems, specifically Lebanese Hezbollah in Syria and Lebanon is assessed to possess high altitude conventional SAM systems, SA-22s, SA-17s, SA-8s, as well as SA-6s. We'll go through these in detail. Um, these systems, uh, the SA-17 in particular, has a range of 50 kilometers or 32 miles. If Lebanese Hezbollah has deployed SA-17s to the Israeli border areas, then flights that are operating within 32 miles of the Lebanese border, which would include the corridors currently that civilian aircraft are flying in into northern Israel to then land at Tel Aviv, would be in range of Hezbollah SA-17 systems. I'm not saying Lebanese Hezbollah intends to shoot down a civilian airliner. What I'm saying, though, is if Israel is conducting strikes against targets in southern Lebanon, which they have every day from 8 through 11 uh, October, and Hezbollah decides to try and engage an Israeli aircraft with an SA-17 or a conventional SAM system, which they have done within the past three years over southern Lebanon, that the spillover into northern Israeli airspace would include conventional surface air missile fire that reaches potentially to the air airways that are being used for flights in and out of um, Ben Gurion International Airport. Also in Syria, the Syrian military has S-200 or SA-5 conventional SAM systems, specifically in Damascus, where airstrikes were conducted today by the IDF. On four occasions since 2021, and as recently as 3rd of July, 
an S200 or SA5 that has a 190 mile range capable of reaching from Damascus to Tel Aviv and actually even further south than that, have been launched at Israeli uh, aircraft that have been conducting strikes into Syria, and they've detonated over Israeli airspace four times since 2021, including as recently as the 3rd of July. That type of scenario could have easily happened today during the Israeli airstrikes against Damascus. Osprey expects additional airstrikes to take place against Damascus in the short term on a weekly basis. And that type of scenario is present. It creates a misidentification potential, um, not only from Lebanon, as I highlighted with the Hezbollah possession of SA-17s, but also from Syria due to the SA-5 uh, possession and use by the, uh, the Syrian military. The misidentification potential is not a hypothetical. The Syrian military in 2018 with an SA-5 accidentally shot down a Russian transport aircraft, Russian military transport aircraft off the coast over the Mediterranean Sea during a set of Israeli airstrikes. So we already have seen in the past a set of uh, Israeli airstrikes into Syria lead to an accidental shoot down of a Russian military transport aircraft by the Syrian military via an SA-5. Possession and use of military weaponized drone, drones is another concern. Um, Palestinian armed groups in Gaza have Iranian-made uh, weaponized drones, albeit be at, 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 in lower quantities and with shorter ranges than what Hezbollah and other Iranian-backed militant groups in Syria have. A leading um, Israeli think tank in 2021 uh, issued a study stating that Hezbollah is assessed to have over 2,000 military-grade weaponized drones. These types of systems, um, for those who have been receiving Osprey alerts for the last five years, uh, would be similar to the types of systems used by the Houthi rebels in Yemen uh, to conduct attacks into Saudi Arabia. They're the same type of drones that uh, Iran has provided Russia to conduct attacks into Ukraine. All altitude uh, SAM systems are being used by several other military forces beyond just Israel and, and Syria. Russia has uh, several different types of conventional SAM systems in, in Syria, and the US-led coalition has other air defense systems in the eastern part of uh, Syria to defend its, its bases there. We have a significant amount of GPS and GNNS interference occurring in the region. The map that is on the right-hand side of the screen shows uh, from gpsjam.org uh, reports from civil aircraft operating over um, the region uh, with the red uh, pentagons showing the uh, location of uh, where they're reporting GPS signal degradation. So in these types of situation, uh, situations where electromagnetic interference is causing GPS um, issues for civil aviation operators, we start increasing the potential for mistakes to be made. It's a, it's a hazard to to uh, to aviation. And if it were only this that was occurring, it could probably be mitigated effectively. When you add in the GPS interference and the potential impacts on the safety of navigation with the threat uh, scenarios that have been outlined above, it highlights why Osprey is significantly concerned for the safety of flight operations over Israeli airspace, Lebanese airspace, um, and Syrian airspace. And then lastly, possession of use of unguided rockets by Lebanese, um, Hezbollah, Iranian-backed militant groups in Syria, and Palestinian armed groups in Gaza. We've seen uh, militants in Gaza launch over 5,000 rockets in, in, in a five-day period. They likely have an arsenal up into the 20,000 or so range, so they can continue to fire rockets at this rate for weeks. Hezbollah is assessed to have at least 50,000 rockets, and Iranian-backed militant groups in Syria uh, likely possess uh, a 30,000-plus stockpile of rockets as well. Um, again, the strikes today against Aleppo International Airport and Damascus International Airport highlight that Israel is likely concerned with Iran providing additional supplies to these Iranian-backed militant groups, specifically in Syria and Lebanon, with a key focal point being Lebanese Hezbollah. Osprey's data analytics uh, for the last four months for Israel, Lebanon, and Syria show a clear escalation in October. Uh, we were already collecting five to 600 uh, incidents and sometimes even higher, 800 incidents in a month, so 20 to 30 incidents a day. Um, we've already collected 1,400 incidents in the first 11 days, uh, or first 12, 12 days of October. 
Uh, by the end of the month, we'll have a 300% a increase in, in activity. We've also had 30 separate notable collections of conflict zone and co conventional military activity that's anomalous, detected by our artificial intelligence tools via Osprey Squawk since the 22nd of November. So the data alone shows what's likely to be a 300% increase in activity uh, this month. And our artificial intelligence examining that data has found 30 separate anomalies within it. Uh, just to give an idea, we've, we've probably had a total of, of 15 anomalies detected in Israel, Lebanon, and Syria the entire year. And now we've had 30 in a two week span. So the data that we've collected in volume and the anomalies that our AI has detected across the data both indicate that the increase in activity in Israel, Lebanon, and Syria points to a wider scale escalation of the Israel-Gaza conflict to areas of Lebanon and Syria in the short term. What we're going to do next is cover some of those capabilities that are that the, the actors in the conflict um, currently have. Uh, Palestinian armed groups such as Hamas have, have uh, rocket stockpiles uh, likely over uh, in excess in aggregate of, of 30,000, uh, though they have drawn down some of those, obviously, with 5,000 launches here since the 7th of October. And is, Israeli strikes in Gaza are likely targeting rocket stockpiles, though uh, rocket fire is, is continued to, to take place uh, as of today and is expected in the weeks ahead. Their longest range rockets would have a, a, a 60 mile or 100 kilometer or so range, uh, though in recent conflicts, they've they've shown capabilities that hadn't been observed before. Um, and Osprey is closely monitoring to see if any new types of weapon systems emerge during the current Israel-Gaza fighting. Light and guided weapons are also present. Man pads capable of below flight level 260 and anti-tank guided missiles below flight level 100. This type of air defense activity is expected to be limited to the Gaza Strip and exposure of civil aviation to this type of activity is expected to be minimal as there are no airways or airports in Gaza. However, weaponized drones are a concern. Commercial off-the-shelf drones have been used by uh, the militant groups um, in Gaza to conduct attacks on the Israeli border. However, in May of 2021, and uh, in this current round of fighting in uh, since 7 October, military-grade weaponized dr drones have been used uh, by Hamas and other groups to target areas deeper in southern Israel. Osprey assesses that the vast majority of drone activity by militant groups and uh, the targets attacked will be in southern Israel uh, and are unlikely to, to reach as far as, as Tel Aviv, though it does remain um, uh, an outlier that such activity could um, uh, be uh, deeper into central Israel from Gaza. From an Iranian-backed militant group perspective in Lebanon and Syria, so Hezbollah in Lebanon and Syria and Iranian-backed militant groups in, in, in Syria, uh, they're equipped with over 2,000 to 3,000 military-grade weaponized drones based on Osprey's assessments, uh, the most capable of those being the Shahed 136. Again, these are the same drones that the Yemeni Houthi rebels um, employed into Saudi Arabia for um, a s several number of years from uh, 2018 to 2022. Um, these are the same drones, Shad 136 is being used by uh, Russia to target Ukraine. Also, Samad 3 type systems uh, are present, and um, the majority of the drones in that, uh, that uh, arsenal of Hezbollah and Iranian-backed militant groups in Lebanon and Syria would be uh, similar to the Kasef variants, uh, so smaller, uh, less of a payload and less of a range, but larger in quantity. And just to highlight, Israel has shot down a number of drones in numbering over uh, uh, 20 in the last uh, five years that have been launched from Syria and from Lebanon via a variety of means. Um, in probably the highest profile event, Israel shot down eight uh, or more. Uh, Hezbollah launched drones um, via a Barak 8 high altitude conventional SAM system in the Eastern Mediterranean Sea. The drones were launched at uh, an Israeli uh, gas exploration platform in the Eastern Mediterranean Sea. So uh, this, these types of uses and attacks by Hezbollah um, and other Iranian-backed militant groups targeting Syria are not a hypothetical. They are, are things that have happened in the past, though Israel has been effective in shooting down um, these drones. Uh, so the, the risk of targets being hit on the ground 
um, is, is mitigated by this. However, it does create the potential for misidentification and miscalculation over Israeli airspace and in Southern Lebanese airspace, as well as Syria. Iranian-backed militant groups such as uh, Lebanese Hezbollah and some other groups in Syria and Iraq have uh, ballistic missiles as well as cruise missiles, um, short-range ballistic missiles like the Fateh 110. Hezbollah likely has hundreds of these. Um, and then other types of systems um, like the Zulfikar and the Zalzal um, are also expected to be um, in the arsenals of uh, Iranian-backed militant groups in Lebanon and Syria. If a conflict does start in earnest in Lebanon or expands in Syria uh, in the, the near term, these types of weapon systems may be used. Um, and the combination of unguided rockets, drones, and ballistic missiles coming from a, a northern front with rocket fire from a southern front in Gaza happening simultaneously would put a significant stress on the ability of the Israeli air defenses to um, uh, effectively deconflict civil aviation from those types of air defense operations. Israeli air defenses, though, are uh, strong and uh, they have a variety. So high altitude conventional SAM systems like the David Sling, the Barak 8, uh, US made Patriot systems. They also have a significant number of Iron Dome systems uh, capable up to flight level 300 uh, deployed in the north, central, and south of the country. These systems are, are most often used to shoot down rockets, though they can shoot down drones and reportedly have the capability to shoot down cruise missiles. Also, Israel has equipped with uh, man pads and other forms of anti-aircraft artillery. It is a layered and integrated air defense uh, network uh, that, again, has been able to uh, defend uh, Israeli airspace effectively uh, through a number of different flare-ups and conflict. However, most of these conflicts have been localized uh, for the most part to uh, southern Israel or with flare-ups in, in the northern border, um, not a coordinated type situation, which is starting to emerge in um, the, the north and the south, and uh, not to the potential uh, volume of rockets, drones, missiles, or other projectiles that could be involved in a in a in a regional conflict scenario with Lebanon and Syria um, taking place at the same time as a, a Gaza flare-up. Again, the Israeli military is is expected by Osprey to be very effective in shooting down drones, missiles, and um, other projectiles launched at uh, Israeli territory that threaten population centers. The main concern that Osprey has is the ability to deconflict civil aviation from that activity simultaneously. Lebanese Hezbollah has a variety of air defense systems. I did talk about this earlier on uh, on one of our slides that dealt with uh, some of our concerns in the region. They have man pads, a variety of them, capable up to flight level 260. They're known to deploy these on the border. Um, with uh, with Israel, and if significant fighting involving Israeli airstrikes were to take place, man pads use on the Lebanese border with Israel would be near certain. There's credible reports that indicate Syria and or Iran have transferred limited numbers of conventional SAM systems to Hezbollah. You can see in this image, Lebanese Hezbollah in possession of SA-6 conventional SAM systems in Lebanon. Um, so the SA-6 possession is not hypothetical. That is confirmed in in open source. Um, Hezbollah also reportedly used an SA-8 in 2021 to engage an Israeli drone um, operating over Lebanese airspace. Uh, both of those systems are capable up to flight level 450, though have ranges below 15 miles. The two concerns that we have are the SA-17s and the SA-22s that have reportedly been transferred to Hezbollah in Syria and or um, uh, Lebanon. The SA-17 has a range of 32 miles. If this is deployed to the border, it can reach 32 miles into Israeli airspace. This would include airways that are currently being used to fly in and out to Ben Gurion International Airport to the north of Tel Aviv. If Israel is conducting airstrikes into Lebanon, which it has done in the last several days, and Hezbollah employs an SA-17, then any aircraft that is operating on those northern areas could be exposed to uh, 
a scenario where an accidental shoot down occurs. The same would be said for a Panzer system, which has a 22 mile range. Um, now this would be the max range of the SA-22 and right at the edge of the airways that are being used um, over Northern Israel. But you combine this with the GPS interference and the potential that aircraft may be operating um, off their normal flight routes if they're directed by Israeli ATC to uh, take a different routing. The exposure to hazardous activity uh, is one that is very difficult for operators to mitigate by themselves. Syrian Iranian backed militant groups, uh, specifically on the eastern border of Syria and Iraq, also have a variety of man pads. Uh, there's reporting from 2021 and 2022 that uh, militant groups uh, backed by Iran and Syria at Darzar Airport have access to uh, SA-6 conventional SAM systems that they've used in eastern Syria to target U.S. Uh, fighter jet aircraft on a couple occasions. These are capable up to flight level 450 and out to 15 miles. And then Iranian-made 358 SAM systems are known to be in possession of groups that operate on both sides uh, of the Iraq and Syria border and um, that are backed by Iran. All right, so now we are going to switch gears just a little bit and we'll start to talk about uh, some of the broader um, discussion points in the region. Um, but after we talk about the Syrian military air defenses, I already discussed much of this, the fact that the Syrian military has S-200 and S-300 systems and that S-200 systems with a 190 mile range and capability up to flight level 900. Um, have been used uh, to target Israeli military aircraft that have conducted airstrikes into Syria, and that those surface air missiles launched from areas of Damascus have detonated over top of Israel, including near Tel Aviv, on four occasions since 2021 and as recently as the 3rd of July. This creates a misidentification possibility, which is very difficult to mitigate. And just today, Israel conducted airstrikes against Damascus International Airport, and Syrian surface air missiles were launched in response. We expect similar activity to occur in the near term. From a forecast perspective, these are the different scenarios that Osprey is looking like. There's certain conditions that have already been met at present, and there's other conditions that are yet to be met that we're monitoring very closely. Osprey assesses that it's near certain that daily rocket fire from Gaza uh, into southern Israel will be met with Iron Dome use to, to uh, shoot down those projectiles um, in the short term, and a two-week period at least is, is, is likely for this. Uh, however, it could persist uh, longer than that, depending on an in, in Israeli military ground operation in Gaza. We also think that continued daily rocket fire from Gaza at Tel Aviv um, and Iron Dome air defense use is likely in the short term, with the, the two-week period uh, being uh, most applicable. We assess it's likely that rocket fire into southern Israel and northern Israel um, within 20 kilometers of the border will also be met with Iron Dome use where applicable. Um, and that uh, that's expected in the short term as well with a, a two week time frame being uh, our key focus area. Large scale military airstrikes in Gaza and limited IDF retaliatory strikes in Lebanon are also likely in the next two weeks at, at, at rates we're seeing at present and additional military strikes into Syria, including Damasco, Damascus and Aleppo airports in attempts to hinder the ability of Iran to provide weapon shipments to Iranian-backed militant groups uh, in Syria and Lebanon, specifically Lebanese Hezbollah, are also likely over the next two weeks. One of the key questions that we're continuing to get, or two of the key questions we're continuing to get is, what does Osprey think about an Israeli ground operation in Gaza, and what is the likelihood that Hezbollah joins Operation Al-Aqsa flood? Osprey assesses that a, a ground operation in Gaza is likely uh, and is expected to start within the next two weeks, and we believe that it's a realistic possibility that Hezbollah will officially join Operation Al-Aqsa flood if an Israeli military ground operation in Gaza commences. Israeli strikes across Lebanon uh, in response to um, Hezbollah joining Operation al flood, including Beirut and uh, its international airport, are also possible um, in, uh, in the next uh, two weeks, but, but also uh, beyond as if this conflict persists. And then the last question we have been getting regularly from um, our clients is, 
uh, direct military strikes in Iran. What is the likelihood of that taking place? We currently assess it to be unlikely that Israel would conduct direct military overt strikes in Iran. There's several reasons why uh, Osprey assesses this to be unlikely. The first being uh, the, the key ways that Israel would be able to get to Iran to conduct the strikes would require either using Syrian airspace and Iraqi airspace or using Saudi airspace. Uh, Osprey assesses it's unlikely that Saudi Arabia would give um, a go ahead for the use of its airspace um, to, uh, to strike Iran. Uh, due to fear that Iran would either retaliate directly against Saudi Arabia, retaliate um, directly against um, military or commercial vessels in the Gulf region, both the Persian Gulf, Strait of Hormuz and Gulf of Oman, and out of fear that um, Yemeni Houthi rebels would resume uh, ballistic missile and drone launches into Saudi Arabia in response to Saudi Arabia allowing um, uh, Israel to conduct airstrikes in Iran using its airspace. Now, the use of Syrian and Iraqi airspace is more feasible for the Israelis to do. They wouldn't need Syria's permission, and Iraq doesn't have the air defenses to, to uh, put up uh, a defense against uh, Israeli penetration of its southern airspace to strike targets in Iran. However, Osprey assesses that it would be likely that the Iranian-backed militant groups in Iraq and Syria, specifically Khatib Hezbollah, Asib al haq uh, and Hakrat al-Nujaba, who have previously targeted the U.S. military um, bases in Iraq and Syria with rockets and drones, would recommence rocket and drone attacks on a frequent basis against our U.S. military forces in Iraq and Syria, uh, targeting Erbil International Airport, Suleymaniyah Airport, Al-Assad Air Base, and uh, Baghdad International Airport. There's a a calculus there uh, that would likely require the United States to give Israel the uh, support or permission to conduct those type of strikes with the impact that could come from that um, in retaliation from Iranian-backed militant groups. Osprey at this time doesn't see that as being palatable for, um, for the United States, though we are continuing to monitor closely any changes in U.S. statements about um, Iranian-backed militant groups in Iraq and Syria and the threat they could pose to U.S. forces in the region. And then uh, lastly, um, any direct military strikes in Iran, again, are going to require um, tanker support. Israel is going to have to air-to-air -air refuel its aircraft to be able to pull off those type of strikes from, from Israel. Again, this is going to require logistical access potentially to Jordanian airspace, for example, um, and previously mentioned Saudi airspace or even Egyptian airspace. Use of those airspaces uh, by Israel is not expected to be um, uh, provided overtly. Um, and uh, Osprey does not expect uh, that regional countries will support Israel in a strike against Iran uh, at present. Though, again, we are monitoring statements by Egypt, uh, Jordan, um, Saudi Arabia uh, in particular uh, about the current conflict in Gaza and anything related towards um, Iranian and Israel uh, re relations at present. I think you can see from what we expect uh, that we do expect a flare up and we expect it in Lebanon and we expect it in Syria. We do not currently expect it in Iraq, Saudi Arabia, or Iran, and to a lesser extent, Jordan and Egypt either. However, Having Osprey as a uh, as a service will provide you access to insights. We'll be continuously updating this situation update on a daily basis uh, for um, at least the next two weeks and providing uh, updates to our clients. Our forecast will continue to evolve as more information uh, emerges. And again, if you only have Osprey alerts and not Osprey forecasts, you're, you're missing uh, this critical piece of predictive intelligence that our current clients have been using uh, to pre-plan mitigation measures and uh, contingency plans um, as conflicts evolve uh, rapidly. Okay, so what we'll do now is um, let's talk about some key takeaways before we head to the question and answer. The bottom line is there's ongoing hazardous activity to aviation in, in northern and southern for Tel Aviv for Damascus and uh, for Beirut, and we expect this to persist in the short term. 
we see a conflict emerging on two fronts at present already, uh, which could increase in intensity should Hezbollah officially join Operation Al-Aqsa Flood uh, with the Palestinian armed groups Hamas and the PIJ. This creates a very difficult situation for um, Israeli air power and air defenses, and it adds significant complexity to deconfliction with civil aviation over the entirety of Israel, Syrian, and Lebanese airspace at all altitudes. Osprey assesses that a key trigger point for Hezbollah joining the conflict in full would be the IDF starting a military ground operation in Gaza, which again, Osprey assesses to be likely within the next two weeks. Factors related to this development are being monitored closely by the Osprey team, and we advise um, everyone on the webinar, but specifically all of our clients, to uh, monitor that key trigger point uh, for, uh, for your planning purposes. Osprey assesses that miscalculation and or misidentification is likely to occur over Israeli, Lebanese, and Syrian airspace at present at all altitudes. Uh, the Iron Dome is very effective. However, in the 2021 May conflict in Gaza, an Israeli Iron Dome shot down um, several Israeli military drones accidentally and also damaged an Israeli F-15 aircraft flying over central Israel. So it has misfired on the wrong targets in the past, and it is possible that those types of incidents have already occurred over Israeli airspace at present, though the details may have not been released. In Lebanese airspace, uh, the Hezbollah possession of high-altitude conventional SAM systems creates uh, a spillover risk into northern Israeli airspace, where civilian aircraft are flying at the same time as um, hostilities on the northern border, um, and a misidentification scenario is, is present there. And as I already noted, the Syrian military shot down a Russian military transport aircraft accidentally via high altitude SA-5 SAM system in 2018 during Israeli strikes into Syria. Today, Israel conducted strikes against Damascus. Surface air missiles were launched in response. We expect that type of activity going forward it is a clear indicator of misidentification manifesting itself, um, not only over Syria, but also over Israel to include around Tel Aviv. Operators need to be prepared for short notice, temporary closures of airspace. Israel could choose to close or restrict its airspace, as could uh, Syria, as well as uh, Lebanon. Monitoring NOTAMs will help you uh, with this, but again, you will be at the, at the mercy of when the NOTAMs are issued. They're not likely to have much warning, um, and they will come into full force immediately when, as they're, they're issued, and you'll have a short reaction time once um, they uh, they do take place. However, if you're an Osprey client with Osprey uh, Sentinel, which is our regulatory notice monitoring service that integrates with your flight plans, please keep an eye on your Sentinel dashboard because if any new notices, advisories, or restrictions are issued by major leading civil aviation governing bodies, we'll automatically notify you that they've been issued and we'll tell you exactly which of your flights are affected by um, those regulatory notices. All right, I think we are uh, good uh, for time still. We've got about 12 um, uh, minutes here uh, to go. I will uh, take a look at the, the question and answer section. And I do think um, uh, uh, I will take some time uh, to allow Andrew back on um, to bring in any questions that have also um, been, been raised. Great. Thanks, thanks, Matt, and and thank you very much for the the depth of your insight um, uh, on all of that. Um, uh, you know, very interesting and 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 clearly exceedingly relevant to all um, all parties on what's going on. Um, we have been asked by um, Mr. Libby Bahat of the uh, of the Civil Aviation Authority of Israel. Um, he is the head of the Area Infrastructure Department to read out a statement um, on on their behalf um, as all of you who've been to our webinars i'm sure and, and i hope uh, understand you know we 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 um you know, being apolitical and and independent it's very important to us but uh, but he, he specifically requested that we read out a statement so i will do that um it is word for words um what he has sent to me um and as i also promised him i would um put his contact details in the chat which i have now done so you should have um his contact details um, to, to to get in touch with him if you um, if you need to, so um, if uh, I'll just read this out um, word for word that he um, sent through. So aerial risks are mitigated by 
separating arrival and departure routes from the conflict area. They are now only north of the airport. Civil military cooperation is both on tactical level um, with the civil and military controllers in the same unit, on the strategic level, planning the contingency routes, and at the technical level, everyone looking at the same aerial picture, controllers and defense system operators. To reduce the risk of human error, defense systems have internal system limitation that prevents the interceptors to pass on those routes or to intercept above those routes, um, brackets debris. The controllers are well trained in these situations due to constant training and conflicts of the past. Ground risks. Limiting the number of loaded and refueled aircraft at the same time is maximum. Aircrafts will be allowed to board only we can, when we can assure the entire way to the runway will be clear to ensure minimum ground time. Ben Gurion and Tel Aviv are protected by two defense systems, David Sling and Iron Dome. Iron Dome alone has a 95% success rate. No rocket has ever hit LLBG or its surrounding perimeter. Two days ago, we witnessed the debris of a successful interception. CAA is constantly monitoring the situation and acts immediately as necessary. Decisions are being made by the Director General of the CAA himself, together with managers of the um, ANSP, the Air Navigation Service Provider. The CAA sees itself as accountable for the safety of civil aviation in Israel and acts accordingly. If the situation escalates, we will close LLBG and move traffic to LLER, Elot Ramon. The conflicts, the, the conflicts risks have zero relevance to LLER because of its location and the flight path to it. There is a lot of false information or simply unverified info um, which is being passed around. We urge companies to contact directly with the CAAI, the Israeli CAA, to read official publication, Israeli NOTAMs, FAA NOTAMs, EASA alerts and CZIBs, and to contact the LLBG Info Center. Um, and I will put the contact details for that also in the, um, the chat here. So everybody has that if you give me just um, uh, one second. Um, so that, as I said, is uh, a statement that was read out by, uh, or that was provided to us by um, Mr. Libby Bart, um, who is the head of the Aerial Infrastructure Department at um, the Civil Aviation Authority of Israel. Um, and I've just put the contact details for LLBG Info Center in the chat um, as well. Um, so hopefully that covers all of um, that. Um, as Matt said, there's a couple of questions um, that have come through. Uh, let me just um, find um, a couple. I've, I've read a couple that the, the people have submitted prior as they registered um, uh, for the event. And thank you very much for those who, who did that. Um, and a couple that came through um, over to you, Matt. What is the possibility, likelihood of the conflict spreading further around the Middle East? I think you've largely answered that, but, but in case you... Uh, um, uh, you wanted to add some more color to that. Sure. I, so the likelihood of it spreading into Syria and in Lebanon um, is it's already started, if you will, uh, though at a, at, at uh, a limited scale compared to Gaza, a realist, we assess it's a realistic possibility that it will reach a larger scale in, in Lebanon, uh, as well as, as Syria, especially in the Southern areas. Uh, once a ground invasion in Gaza starts, we think it's a limited or unlikely, uh, excuse me, an unlikely uh, scenario at present for uh, this to spill over to uh, Saudi Arabia, um, Iraq, or Iran. Though we're monitoring those indicators closely, both via our artificial intelligence tools, via Osprey Squawk, uh, the data analytics in Osprey Explore, and the expertise of our, our analyst uh, team to interpret uh, that data uh, and provide our clients with accurate forecasts uh, through our our forecast notification service. Great, thanks, Matt. Um, there was a question about the situation of war risk insurance coverage, uh, approvals for rescue flights, and long term requirements. Um, as I mentioned at the start, please do get in touch with your um, your insurance providers, your your brokers. Um, uh, and as I said, we've done this in partnership with Gallagher. So Gallagher's are, are fully aware and aligned with with all the information we've given. Um, so they're ready to support um, anybody who who has questions on uh, on that side. Um, there was a question about the explanation of how AI is used for Osprey risk assessments. I'm I'm, I'm hoping that, that Matt has covered that um, during the presentation. 
And one other question I wanted to ask Matt was about um, repatriation flights. A question came through about that. Um, and obviously risk tolerance for repatriation flights may be higher than than other civilian um, uh, civil aviation flights. Um, is there any advice uh, in terms of mitigation measures that you might be able to offer um, in terms of um, flight times and, and that kind of thing that you may be able to offer for, for, for operations? So I, I think actually the, the statement from the Israeli Civil Aviation Authority is very useful in regards to repatriation flights. They're highlighting several mitigation measures that they're putting in place for um, the ground exposure. Uh, so uh, the timings that they're putting in place, uh, the number of fueled and, and passenger aircraft um, at one time, uh, following those coordinating directly with, with the Israeli Civil Aviation Authority uh, is useful. The one thing that we can do at Osprey is look at the data. And since the 7th of October, after the initial wave of rockets was being fired on the 7th, if you look at activity on the 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, and even today, um, rocket fire deeper into Israel targeting Tel Aviv, um, including uh, the barrages that were near uh, Ben Gurion International Airport, or even the ones further north uh, towards Haifa or Netanya, uh, they're occurring during daylight hours and in the afternoons in general. So if you can look at timings for your your flights in in um, uh, in time frames that have typically not in in the the conflict so far um, included rocket barrages at Tel Aviv, you may be able to find additional um, ways to mitigate your exposure to um, rocket fire deeper into to Israel for, from Gaza, um, which obviously mitigates some of the shoot down risk as well, because if rockets aren't being fired, then iron domes would not be be launched um, during that time frame either. However, I, I implore anyone conducting repatriation flights. If you're an Osprey client, uh, look into using Osprey Oracle, um, the service to be able to engage directly with the analyst team uh, to get some bespoke analysis support to your specific flight operation above and beyond what you can get in our core alerts and report service. Um, if you're not an Osprey client, and you have a different service provider. Uh, speaking directly with um, uh, uh, an independent expert on um, these types of uh, mitigation uh, measures around uh, complex flights, including repatriation, uh, is, is one of the best pieces of advice I can give as well. Great. Um, thanks, Matt. Um, that's covered the questions that I've had. Um, I do, do you want to address any of the questions that are in the uh, um, in the quest, in the Q&A? Sorry, just before you do, Matt, before, just before we jump in that, I've, I've also had a, a, a message from Libby Bahat from the Civil Aviation Authority of Israel saying that he's very happy to schedule a cool a separate um, meeting or call with um, everybody uh, or anybody who would like to, um, please do get in touch with him um, through the contact details that I, I put in the chat. Um, Matt, back to you. Sure. So uh, one of the questions that's been asked, can you support your concerns about Israeli possibility to deconflict civil military activities by some additional information, evidence, or past incidents? Um, I, I did list off several incidents during the briefing. Um, but I, I can list several right now if, if you'd like the sourcing to, to Osprey specific incidents. If you have Osprey Oracle as a service, um, you can uh, reach out via your dedicated uh, scheduling tool uh, to set up a meeting with our team and we can provide all that. Um, if you're not an Osprey client and you would like the, the sourcing and the additional information, we can provide it. But just going uh, down uh, from most recent to, to past, on the 19th of May, 2022, an IDF Iron Dome system mistakenly fired interceptor missiles at an Israeli military drone on the Israel-Lebanon border. The IDF reportedly misidentified its own drone, likely as a Hezbollah drone launched from southern Lebanon. On the 18th of February, 2022, an IDF Iron Dome air defense system unsuccessfully engaged a Hezbollah drone over Israel near the Sea of Galilee. So it attempted to shoot down a drone with Iron Domes and it missed. So those Iron Domes detonated in the sky. During the May 2021 conflict, several Israeli military drones were reportedly misidentified as drones being launched from Gaza, and at least one was shot down by an Iron Dome uh, air defense system. Others had Iron Domes fired at them, though the drones were not shot down. During the May 2021 conflict, an Israeli uh, Air Force US-made F-16 fighter jet was reportedly misidentified as either a drone or a rocket launched from Gaza 
by Palestinian armed groups and was subsequently engaged over southern Israel by an Iron Dome system causing damage to the aircraft fuselage. It did successfully make a, a, a landing after uh, being hit, um, but those incidents are just the, the most recent ones that Osprey has collected from public official statements from uh, within Israel, as well as from uh, traditional media reporting and Israeli think tank reporting on past uh, conflicts between Israel, Gaza, and potential conflicts uh, between Israel and Lebanese Hezbollah. I do trust that the Israeli Civil Aviation Authority and the Israeli military are doing everything they possibly can uh, to try and deconflict civil aviation from being exposed to hazardous activity. However, as was already stated, these are not fail safe. The Iron Dome is a 95% effectiveness that leaves 5% um, in question. Uh, and Osprey will continue to monitor for any types of, of incidents related to misidentification, um, miscalculation, um, or uh, surrounding uh, poor deconfliction with civil aviation. And we'll continue to provide updates related to any of those events uh, through our Osprey Alert Service. Um Matt, we've 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 come to the end of the uh, of the allotted time, so I think um, uh, we'll we'll leave it there. Um, I, I know there's an awful lot going on, and we need to to get back to making sure we're we're, we're covering it all. But um, please do um, reach out to us um, either through you know if you are a client of ours, either through your your um, client success manager or or direct through us um, through uh, through the emails. Um, if you have any further questions, or or would you like any 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 more specific um, support? Um, I'd like to thank Matt for um, his deep insights into into the situation and what's going on there. Um, and I wish you all um, safe travels um, and safe flying. Um, and uh, and hopefully look forward to to seeing you all again soon. Um, thank you very much indeed for attending. Um, we if there are any other further questions, we will try to answer them in a in a follow up email. Um, any further questions that that, that came through the uh, through the chat. Um, right. Well, thank you very much, everyone, and uh, and take care.